So let's start with some brief introductions. I'll just I'll let you introduce yourselves, uh, starting with you, Taylor. Yeah, hi, I'm Taylor Monahan. I'm the founder and CEO of MyCrypto. Uh, MyCrypto is a, uh, it's a user interface for interacting with the Ethereum blockchain. A lot of people call it like a wallet. I just don't really like that word. Um, and yeah, I'm just here trying to make this space uh, better in literally any way, shape, or form. <laughs> Uh, hey, I'm Dan Finlay. I'm a co-founder and lead developer at MetaMask. We are a, a tool for interacting with smart contracts on the Ethereum blockchain. Hi, I'm David Gold. I'm a CEO of Dapix. Uh, we are building the FIO protocol, uh, which is a blockchain usability protocol that will do for blockchain what HTTP did for the internet, make it easy to use through an industry standard that connects wallets, exchanges, crypto payment processors, and we're backed by Binance and five venture funds and have 28 industry partners. Uh, hello, my name is Zoria Lohan. I'm the CEO of Zango. It's a crypto wallet that has launched recently and uh, that has the particularity to be non-custodial but what work without private keys and with a very seamless experience. Um, maybe we'll talk more about that. Well, let's start on that topic. I like that at least three of you mentioned experience or user experience. Um, I think you said it was a tool. Uh, yeah, but yeah. you use a tool. Yeah, <laughs> you use a tool. Uh, so l let's start with that. Um, you know, and and in this self custody space, because I think I, I agree with you that like wallet is kind of like a word that's sort of phasing out, and people are moving towards uh, more of this idea of self custody, etc. Uh, in in the self custody space, what do you think are some of the major advancements that we've seen in the last year with regards to user experience and usability? Well, this year, I think, has been a big year for seeing... Well, so last year, I think there were a lot of new wallets that were starting to try uh, releasing backups with, like, uh, e e email or your phone number or something like that. So there's going to be a kind of semi-custodial solution. And then this year, there have also been several, I think, smart contract wallets starting to get some traction and, and usage. And that's uh, really exciting because smart contracts are kind of what uh, a Turing complete blockchain is good for. So... Um, so yeah, there's obviously, once you're a smart contract, you get to kind of opt into the security model that you like. It doesn't mean that there aren't keys. So I, I take odds when everyone's, whenever anyone claims to not have keys in their crypto um, solution, but, but it does mean that you can put the keys where you want, and you can be creative about it, and, and that's great. Creativity is what this space is all about. Yeah, I, uh, I completely agree, and I, um, I think that we're entering sort of a new, like a new phase of sort of experimentation in terms of where um, where the keys are going to be and and where does the balance lay between um, you know the most secure solution versus like the most usable solution because as we all know um, it's a hard balance to strike and so I'm I'm really excited to see um, how these sort of like the smart the smart contract or the smart wallets play out um, I'm also really um, excited to see how some of the the usability features right so like abstracting away gas abstracting away um, the keys in general how that um, you know what's actually valuable to users rather than just like we think that this might be valuable um, and then most importantly I'm I'm really looking forward to I think that the privacy conversation is going to come to the forefront um, and seeing how and what the wallets do and how they can empower users to do things um, in a private manner. Um, I'm, I'm really hopeful <laughs> that, that we can figure something out because, um, yeah, you know, Libra, China, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> Yeah, so um, we're obviously uh, biased with what we're doing and focused on, on on the usability aspects of moving the value around, and custody is a critical issue, which is not something we're solving, and all the innovation that's going on and was just discussed is really cool and important, but at the end of the day, um, having custody of your assets is only important if you actually can do something with them, and that means being able to move them. Um, and we launched our test net this week, so we think that's pretty big news because uh, it means that we're on the precipice of, of these players here and others being able to do things between their products that are fundamentally impossible to do today and to do that in a completely decentralized and secure way. Um, so there have been some, uh, some progress uh, recently in, uh, uh, in, in wallets. To, to my test, is that include ourselves? Not enough. I think we're still uh, very far away from uh, creating product that excites enough people to bring them to the industry. And that's the bad news. The good news uh, is that uh, I think there are step function improvements that are being made in terms of uh, ways 
keys are generated and transactions are being signed. Uh, so you refer to smart wallet, uh, a smart contract wallet. Um, that's interesting, but that applies only to Ethereum or derivatives of Ethereum. So there is the rest of the world. I think there's been uh, very interesting progress in multi-sig that have been done. Uh, very interesting development with null signatures, uh, threshold signatures, and that start to become adopted by not just wallet, but also type of custodian. Um, now, I think in terms of application, uh, I think we are still in the first era of crypto where most people still have to back up their, their keys and they're still doing that. So I think something is missing. I'm not sure quite right exactly. Uh, apparently, we're not doing good job enough to, do, to arrive there, but uh, I think we're getting there. So, so you, mas you mentioned the, these, these step improvements in usability, and I always like to sort of look at this as like two parts of a scale, right? So you, on one side, there's like usability, and on the other side, there's technology. And I'm curious, in your minds, if you think that like, it's sort of like a chicken and egg problem, is it the usability that's arriving and then pushing the technology forward, or are we making advancements in technology that are allowing like new forms of what, new use cases and applications to be built specifically on the wallet side, like for example, like cryptography that it would allow um, you know, multi-signature schemes or this sort of thing? What's your viewpoint on that? Yeah, so uh, it is a chicken and egg problem, right? Um, you have to have usable solutions for them to be used, and if they're not being used, the usability is kind of useless. Um, but uh, if you look back at the internet as, as a corollary, I mean, it was around for over 10 years, and it had millions of users, and it was growing, but it was growing relatively slow, and it had a bunch of siloed protocols that you people used to interact with it, and it was clunky and hard, and it was a usability protocol that caused that all to change. Um, so, you know, I do think that, that in order to get the masses, the people who are not in this room, to actually start feeling comfortable using it, we've got to get it to a whole other level of ease of use and safety and security uh, on the movement of the value as well as the custody of the value. And I think that's what's exciting about what's going on now. Um, there's the real work of, of making blockchain functional and easy to use, I think, has been happening in the last year and is starting to happen much more than, than what happened in the few years before that. Yeah, I uh, I think I take a I, I totally agree with you that like there's there's this still siloed effect kind of similar to the early internet where I, I think there's a lot of creativity and ingenuity that can bring a lot of value to these platforms, but a, a lot of times that that value is kind of blocked by things like the usability of those protocols. So we've had state channels for like two years, but um, what's a state channel wallet? Right, So there's kind of been this thing where you need a wallet to integrate, and so a lot of new protocols and new ideas that have new value to offer end up having to implement a wallet from scratch just to do it. Um, so I, I actually, I often t am taking kind of an oppositional role to this um, thing that like usability is everything and that we just need to solve usability. Because I, I think ultimately people will actually get over a lot of usability things if there's value for them. We've, we've seen people, you know, I, I'm not trying to claim that MetaMask is a seamless experience, but for the people that it's made a difference for, they've worked through it. And I feel like sometimes we're like polishing or, or like widening the doors to a, to a garbage buffet. As if, we, if we just put some better things on the table, uh, I think people will, will make their way through. And, uh, and so that's why at MetaMask, one of our current fo uh, focuses is on allowing the wallet itself to be more permissionlessly extended to support uh, community ingenuity so that uh, hopefully we can grow the pie in the middle and, and people can work through and be creative with uh, the, the usability along the way then. I love that garbage buffet. I'm yeah, I love that. that too. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. I, I might quote you on that sometimes. <laughs> right? Like, that's that's a headline for this talk right now. Um, no, I completely agree. And I think that we saw this with ICOs, right? Like, there was such, uh, there was such promise, and most of those promises were very, very empty. But people somehow went from uh, not holding any crypto, right, being true no-coiners, to uh, purchasing, moving it to a non-custodial wallet, and then sending it somewhere else and receiving tokens and be able to view those tokens in like a day. Now, uh, not everyone was successful. We saw a lot of loss. We saw a lot of loss due to um, like just addresses in general and sending and like those concepts. Um, we saw a lot of loss from uh, not making proper backups. Um, you know, and there's no way to restore, uh, and then obviously there's there's no like revocation either. So you, uh, uh, if you lose your private key or you give your private key to a fisher, it, it's gone. So um, yeah, it's sort of there. There's very much chicken and egg, but 
Um, if the value is there, if the promise is there, people will do just about anything to do it. Um, and as we've seen, the amount of uh, sort of usability, like it, the improvements that we've seen since the ICO sort of era um, have been huge, right? And we learned a lot of lessons. So I think that um, we'll get there. It would be really nice if we got there a bit faster and, and with a bit more thought. Um, but I'm really interested in seeing where uh, where the true value comes from, right? Because we see, we hear a lot these days about how this is going to be it, or that's going to be it, or IEOs are the thing, or um, uh, DeFi is the thing. And you know, I, the question that I keep asking is, what value does that provide for the user, or what value does that create for the user? Um, and if we can get there, um, we as like wallet creators will actually be better. Uh, equipped to build a product for them because we will be understanding of what they're trying to accomplish, not necessarily just like we'll build this thing that allows you to maybe do anything and nothing at the same time. Oriel, I'm, I'm really excited about your answer because I know you guys are sitting really at the, the forefront of like the tech and also the user experience. So, so actually, I'm not going to talk about us, but about something that I think is... Uh, it's not that I don't want to talk about us, but I think something more important than that is I think uh, you know, obviously the future of computing is mobile. Uh, it's not the desktop. There is way more people with a mobile phone than a computer. We all know that. And sadly, uh, this is where the biggest usability problems exist. Um, and that applies to every single player, including those who try to do mobile applications, including ourselves. And it's not necessarily te technological. It's mostly due to the fact that the mobile platforms, and I won't name names, but you know, that's not so many, uh, it, uh, are not necessarily uh, allowing us to play by our rules, but to play by their rules. So what that means is that the experience that we enjoy on desktop interfacing the wallet with anything very conveniently, and let's call that permissionless, is not necessarily possible on the mobile. No matter how much you develop on the mobile, you are not allowed to um, accept replacement in a purchase to, uh, to service dApps and to service anything that is a way of payment. Uh, you're not able to have a dApp directory and things of that nature. And if we really want to be uh, usable, if we want to have wallets that are really usable, we cannot just think desktop, we have to think mobile first. So that I think is a big hurdle. Uh, and it's very intimidating for people, including in the space, to deal with that friction. Do you think that friction is, um inherent to that this friction that's inherent to mobile platforms do you think that's a hindrance on potential business models for for wallets and just generally i'd like to hear your thoughts on what are you know the interesting business model or business model opportunities that uh, are open to wallets today so yeah directly that directly impacts the business model because um as you know, I mean, uh, many people never understand that, but wallets don't make money out of transactions. The fees are paid to miners, and so you know, you know, it's not a banking model where you take a fee every time there's a transaction. So how do wallets make money? They make money out of basically an affiliation system. Most of the time, they link to exchanges, they link to hardware wallets, they link to whatever. But if you want to make money with dApps, with services, with DeFi, and get a cut out of that, you need the mobile platform to allow you to do that, right? And so I think. It's it's very structural to the economy of wallets. And uh, I'm not sure there will be a solution to that. So maybe we'll have to think about something better. But that obviously has an impact. Yeah, and, and I just want to build on that because I think you made a really important point. Even dialing back from the, uh, the business model use case, uh, the, the current application stores, the mobile platforms, they won't allow you to do a variety of things. They have their own policies. And so, for example, a variety of wallets that were very similar to MetaMask uh, got uh, blocked from the Apple App Store uh, last year because they had a dApp store, right? Um, so, you know, just by calling it a store, it's against their terms of use. So there's, there's an amount of extensibility that they want to have on lockdown. You know, we saw Apple take like, you know, nearly a decade to open a Siri API and they've just opened a, a sliver of it. They're, they're very cautious about the amount of extensibility they lend, and, uh, and this extends to applications. So I, I agree that it's like a completely critical frontier because crypto is so about innovation, uh, and it's so very carefully regulated by these two companies right now. Taylor, do you have any thoughts? I actually had another question. How did you guys get around some of the limitations? We call them sites. <laughs> <laughs> the uh, are you the guys secrets out of the bag, folks. Are you guys already <laughs> live in the App Store or in test flight? Uh, what, what's that? Are you oh, live in the App Store? We, we have a live mobile app. So if you go to metamask.io, you can install our mobile app. 
Um, so on the, the App Store. Yeah, yeah. So the good news is that these app stores are maintained by bureaucrats who enforce the letter of the law. But we'll see how long that lasts. Um, I think at a certain point, we're going to need a more open platform. Yeah, I completely agree. And um, because I remember talking to you back back in the day about di the different concerns, and I think one of the most interesting things about the the mobile platform and and the fact that you are um, you're basically relying on on Apple and Google to allow you to distribute your application. Um, that's like a very dangerous place to be in, in my opinion. Um, and and what's even more sort of um, um, I guess you guys looked deeper, right? And you looked in and you saw exactly what they were enforcing and it turns out it was like the, the semantics or whatever, which is great because you can get around that. But um, uh, yeah, there's a, lot of, um, there's a lot of policies that I think will, will hinder a lot of things. Um, and I also think that the, uh, you know, the security and the technology in general, um, you know, everyone has their opinions on whether iPhones or, or Android phones are secure at all. Um, but I think that that's going to be uh, probably a huge conversation um, that happens, especially if people are holding more than like, you know, a couple dollars, uh, you know, worth of crypto on their phones. Yeah, first of all, I think it's a great question because um, the companies that are providing the usability products that people use, like those on the stage here, um, they have to make money, right? Otherwise, ultimately, they're going to go away. Um, and so business models no, we're are not. important. <laughs> um, the, that's that's the goal for sure. <laughs> Siri's, you're in trouble now. Siri's been listening. Siri just Siri just this heard is, what you this said. Is literally, why we <laughs> need more privacy. Guys. Oh my god. So, uh, but anyway, um, that was that was a core driver behind um, you know the FIO protocol being set up as a decentralized autonomous consortium, where the economics of our protocol, from from the actual structure of it, are are built to drive tokenized income to the wallets and others that participate in the ecosystem. So, so that plays part and parcel because of that knowledge that, look, if the wallets have to continue to be there and the end endpoints have to be there for users to use and they have to make money to do it. So uh, on that point, uh, what, what we've seen with wallets is that wallets are, are, are incorporating um, an increased amount of services. So there's obviously key storage and everything comes around that. And then, you know, take a smart contract wallet, for instance, there's an awful lot of additional layers of services like um, um, like uh, abstracting a gas, for instance, uh, social recovery, et cetera. Um, but you know, there are a few ways to look at this. One is, okay, well, we're adding functionality to wallets. The other is that you know, we're making wallets more and more bloated and adding, um, creating a, a, a wider attack vector. Um, perhaps starting with you, David, because you're working on sort of a, another abstraction layer. Where do you think this this balance stands for wallets? Uh, should should wallets be trying to incorporate more of these features internally, or uh, do you think the space will move towards one where all these additional services will be abstracted and wallets will ultimately end up just being key storage? Um, I I don't think that wallets as a product as they exist today will just be key storage. Um, not software wallets, at least hardware wallets. To, to yes. Um, if they are just key storage five years from now, I think they won't exist as a standalone product because key storage will be integrated into other things that do a lot more than just store your keys. Um, and the usability and the ways in which people can, can, can interact with that value in commerce and for utility uh, will be in ways we can't even have even thought about today. And, and those solutions have to be the portal and tools that they use for that, right? And so the companies on the stage here and other ones, I think, are going to grow and evolve and become more and more robust in the, in the types of, of things that their wallet enables users to use beyond just storing the keys. Otherwise, th really, they'll just store key storage is something that'll be commoditized, I think, honestly, eventually. Yeah, I am. Um, uh, I, I wrote, I did a talk, I think it was like over a year ago now. It was called The Future of Ethereum Doesn't Have Wallets. Um, but it um, it really dove into the question of like, what the hell is a wallet? Um, and what, uh, where do these different like, you know, features of wallets today, where do they lie and where are they most optimal? Um, and I, I ask a lot of questions, like way more questions than answers, but um, I've definitely, I think that what's going to happen is that um, there's going to be some core functionality that is just functionality, right? And that's not a product, that's just a thing that exists that can be sort of um, at, at different layers of the stack. Um, and then I think that 
you know, looking at how we interact with like traditional applications today or, or traditional products and services, typically you, um, like say Uber, right? Like you go and you like open your app and you order a car and then like at some point it just like you automatically pay for your ride, right? It's not at the forefront. You don't go into, um, you know, <laughs> you don't open another application that's gonna connect to your Uber so that you can send to this and then, oh wait, but the gas and you don't have enough gas because of the token, like none of that exists. And so um, it'll be really interesting to see, especially as actually valuable dApps evolve um, and there's there's real use cases where um, you have a product that the product itself wants users to come to their site land on their site uh, be sold on their product or service or game or what what be it um, and then the user just starts using it right because the flow right now at least in ethereum is is very commonly like the the user lands on the site uh, and then hopefully they're convinced to like use this game or buy this product or use the service whatever it is and then they're like okay, cool, go install MetaMask and then come back when you're done. And then MetaMask is like, hey guys, like I'm gonna onboard you real quick to the entire crypto ecosystem. Oh, by the way, you have to go buy some ether. So, uh, you know, go KYC in exchange. We'll see you when you're done. Mm. You know, and, and the reality is, is like, I don't know what the drop off rates look like, but I, I can't imagine that they're, I can't imagine they're good. Like they would be terrifying, right? Um, and so I'm really interested in, in seeing if, um, Right now, I don't think that we have like a, a invisible interaction layer, right? Um, and and I think that that might be a solution. I have no idea how technically it would work and how it would um, preserve privacy and how it wouldn't be um, like it has the potential to take a lot of information from both sort of like the wallet functionality and the DAP functionality, um, and that's a bit worrisome. But if it if it if there's some invisible interaction layer that could be created, I think that that. Uh, might replace like most of the quote unquote wallet. Um, and then you can have choices at each end, right? The choices of the DAP or what you want to interact with or what you want to give your data to, what you want to play with. Um, and then where, where the key is, who has the key, is the key being held by a custodian or is it yourself or is it your hardware wallet? Yeah, it's sort of like commoditizing each layer, each, each uh, service that connects to your wallet. Uh, I think I, I agree with both of you that, that they have to evolve a lot, and then what does it look like? Can we make that look more invisible? Um, we've been working on this initiative at, at MetaMask, sorry, not to shamelessly promote, but it's like a, it's a permission system, and so the goal is that you initially prompt, you delegate a key, a spending allowance, uh, encryption rights, whatever, and so now the application can do some interactions without uh, further bothering you. And so one of the things we're using that for is to extend functionality because uh, I don't know what the you know end protocol is, it, what the state channel or the plasma chain or whatever. Um, so we're hoping that can facilitate that. You know, even when you're using Uber, like it's it's invisible once you're in it. But there was like an initial like handshake, right? You entered your credit card number, you you Apple paid or whatever. And and I think we can we can really reduce that initial handshake down to something that's like a user coherent like terms of agreement that's being digitally enforced. And so I kind of think of of the wallet. And, and where we are trying to mold it is is kind of into your like personal trust kernel. Uh, it's it's like the thing which takes you know your your cryptographic keys. Which yeah, you can commoditize a signer, but can you commoditize the like human representation of what you can do with those keys? Mm -hmm. And so I think that we're really crafting our product into we're basically what it, what does it mean to to sh prompt the user and get get informed consent. Uh, because keys are meaningless, the user isn't doing the cryptographic uh, operation themselves, so they need some somebody that they they trust, and and you know why not the thing that's holding their keys because they're trusting it quite a bit there to uh, represent to them what they're doing under the hood. Um, I don't have anything particularly interesting to say here. Well, do you think Zengo <laughs> will be commoditized? What <laughs> do you think? Well, uh, Zengo will be commoditized. I I don't know. I mean, one thing is certain is that people are not going to download 50 wallets and use them. Uh, all the way. I mean, it's not possible. I got it's always interesting right to see those blockchains that also develop their wallets, believing that people will use them. So I still don't understand that. But eventually, people will have a very limited choice of wallets, and they will expect those, whatever we call them, uh, 
password managers, interfaces, tools, wallets, but they will expect them to accompany them across all the needs of the, uh, that they have, the services they want to use, whether this is on mobile, on desktop, and whatever computing platform tomorrow, including those watches and uh, whatever AirPods we have in our ears. And so um, what that means is that no matter how uh, the, pro the wallet services are developed, they need to be thought as services and not as software. Uh, so I think that's very important as a conception. Um, you can see that in the fiat world that, that has happened f during the past 20 years. And you can see, for example, companies like Square doing that and Stripe doing this, enabling their services being built on top of the same payment trails wherever you need them. I, I do expect that to happen at some point on crypto, of course, respecting the principles of crypto. Uh, but uh, I, I think it will depend on the wallets that prepare people will prefer to use. I think that will have to do with convenience and security uh, and portability to different platforms. Um, the future will let us know how that plays out. Cool. So switching gears a little bit, I'd like to, to bring this up a little bit uh, to somewhat of a higher level. Um, today, the majority of crypto funds are locked up in exchanges. Some would say you know, upwards of 80 to 90 percent. Uh, where does the future hold? And from this perspective, is the future a, a, a non-custody or a self-custody future or a custody future? I think the, the future actually is neither a self or a centralized custody future. I think it's going to be solutions that we're seeing uh, happen that, that give you a better and best of both worlds. Um, the reality is um, I think the average person on the street, if you truly ask them, they do not want to be solely responsible for all of their assets. That's really scary to them. Uh, they also don't want to be subject to a hack attack on the centralized, you know, bank or or financial institution. So I think we'll I think we're going to see some really cool s solutions that have wallets involved, self sovereign wallets, but also have some sharing of that risk with third party trusted third parties that create a pr create a better outcome um, and an exciting future for what we're doing here. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm, I do not claim to have the answer, but I, I do think that, um, you know, nobody actually wants to be their own bank. Um, and I say this as someone who has made a non-custodial wallet for the past, like, three and a half years. Um, you know, I, I'm acutely aware that, that people are, um, there's a very, 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 very specific user that actually wants that and actually wants to take on that responsibility and actually understands what that responsibility is. Um, and I think that one of the most interesting things about this sort of crypto space right now is that um, the more involved you are, the longer you're around, um, like the scarier it gets. Um, you actually learn about these risks that you didn't know were risks. Um, Ignorance you know, is bliss. Yeah, like the tenth time you send like all of your money, or um, you know the 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 hundredth time you're sending like a large amount either to or from an exchange for whatever reason, um, it's actually scarier, and that's a really peculiar thing, especially from a user experience perspective, because um, typically we we can at least rely on the fact that as time goes on and as people use your product more, um, their anxiety level will go down. Right, like that's naturally like what should happen, um, but because of all the sort of external forces, because of the hacks, because of the number of things that can go wrong, and simply because of how new um, and different this space is, um, we're not seeing that. And so I think that in order to, um, you know, create a like the solution we should be going after is one that that reduces anxiety, right? And I think that's why people do tend to put them in exchanges and leave them there, is because they're like, well. The exchange has it, like everything's fine. You know, it's it's not sort of um, near, it's not as much in front of their face as if they're they're holding their own funds. Yeah. So yeah. And centralized exchanges, you know, also exist not just because of custody issue. They exist because the centralized exchanges enable things that are impossible to do other ways today, uh, such as trading one token for another token or for fiat. Mm -hmm. um, but in the future, it will be possible. Projects like Cosmos and Polkadot are going to enable you to, to, in a decentralized way, start to trade tokens. Projects like ours are going to enable usability that you can't do out of centralized walled gardens today. Mm -hmm. um, and then it does come down to the issue of custody. And with better solutions, we will end up in a much more decentralized world than, than crypto and blockchain exist today. 
Yeah, yeah. I, I'm not a, a maximalist of, of user custody, but I think there's something just fundamentally empowering about having your own key, at least like for an account or your first account when you're learning, because there is no higher authority than an account that's controlled by a key. Uh, now, now, that said, we can do so much better, but every single other thing, like Taylor said, has other risks. So it's like, oh, great, you got a multi-sig. Well, I hope it doesn't have any bugs. Or like, you know, and you're putting it into a new piece of software. I hope you can trust that team and their distribution channel. And uh, there's, there's really just a huge stack of assumptions. And uh, so I, I'm just glad that we're building on protocols that let you move the keys where you want and take the risks that you basically hopefully can take in an informed manner where you, you know, hopefully in a wallet that's flexible and adaptable, it can progressively onboard you initially, you know, okay, sign up for this service, they'll back it up maybe, and then maybe now you wanna have some friends who can help you recover, and maybe once you become like a real uh, buried under your mattress kind of guy, uh, you can take your, <laughs> your, your seed phrase for yourself. But, but I think there's something really empowering about having the keys at, at a base layer available. Uh, so, um, I'm, I'm not going to reveal uh, breaking news or uh, things that people don't know, but people like convenience. Uh, they like things that work and um, that are, like you said, anxiety reductors. And uh, the reality is we already know the majority of people have chosen custodian uh, solutions versus non-custodian solutions because those are the best uh, today to serve that purpose. It's just simpler. And uh, you have a phone line that you can use. It's an expression. And to bark on if you have a problem, and hopefully you're going to get your problem solved. And as we know, in self custodial solutions, you always have these giant disclaimers. We won't help you. You're alone. And, and deal with your own shit, right? And be your own bank. Deal with your own shit. So uh, that's not something that uh, I think the majority of people will want. Maybe there will be ways that self-custody will be improved uh, via the help of, um, I don't know, uh, guardians or peers. Uh, I, I'm very skeptic about that because I think people don't know how to make those choices. Um, I, I, I do tend to believe that the future has to do with the user being in control. So I think that is a fundamental need that today um, doesn't exist enough, but is not alone. And uh, for example, what we've tried to do is to decentralize the, the process of key management uh, without getting into many details, where only the user is able to make transactions, uh, but we uh, help, can help in the recovery and set up backup in a, in a way that is really magical because they don't have all this anxiety to deal with, but we are unable to spend our money even if we want to. So I don't know if this is the solution, but what we are learning from our first user base is that they breathe after they use this kind of uh, approach. So maybe that will be the future or we will see. Mm, that's a good point. Um, I, I hate to bring, up, to bring up the boring regulatory question, but I'm curious, I mean, in, in the context of you know, mostly favorable regulation with regards to self-custody wallet developers uh, in the US and in Europe at least, um, is this a question that uh, I wouldn't say keeps you up at night, but uh, what, what are the sort of regulatory considerations um, which have to do with each of the products that you're working on, if any? I don't know if this is a relevant question on this panel or not. I mean, all my, my answer is quick. So uh, where we're at right now, we're, we're fine. Um, if we like dip our toe into that pool, then um, I'm in a very different boat and I need a very different team and I need a very different set of skills and I need like 80 more lawyers in my life and I don't want 80 more lawyers in my life. So what pool exactly? <laughs> the, the like any sort of, if you, you go down like custodianship, if you go down um, okay. anything that would, would classify us as like a money transmitter. Um, you know, you need a lot, um, and I'm I'm very glad that there are people willing to go down that path. But um, I would I, for me personally, and, and the people around me, the people on my team, the people I've hired, um, we're very excited to be uh, taking a challenging path in a different way of of empowering users to control their own money, control their own keys, um, you know, and, and successfully interact with the blockchain, um, you know, without needing the approval of us or the U.S. government. Yeah, my, mine is also really small because because we're we're 
custodial, we're a non-custodial wallet, right? You're holding your keys, so right now our regulatory environment is simple. Uh, we've been kind of begging services to start emerging, to take on custody or semi-custody for a while. The first time we met Coinbase, we were like, you guys should host keys. They're like, we don't want to be liable for arbitrary transactions that we can't comprehend. Like, so, so there's been like a real need for that. Um, I've heard murmurs about regulation around non-custodial wallets. Uh, that that made me lose a couple winks, but I haven't heard more about it. So yeah, I'm, I could see that coming up I'm for more like consumer protection reasons. I mean, especially like in Europe, I could see the European regulators waking up and saying like, "Oh, people are holding crypto; yeah. they need to be protected." Uh, yeah, there's like one line that says if you interpret like one of the money transmitter lines in a very 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 specific way, you can you can lose a couple nights sleep saying that like a non-custodial wallet is technically like sending money for a user. But you know, if you literally kind of like, um, I don't know, spend five more minutes looking at it um, or looking at what non-custodial actually means, um, you know, the way that we've interpreted it obviously is like that's silly. Sorry, you were saying. Oh uh, no, I mean that's that's pretty pretty well wrapped up. I'm like especially curious to hear because you're yeah. doing a slightly recovery thing. Does that affect you anymore? Yeah, so so we good. Uh, we we looked into the topic, <laughs> but I I tell you, I'm not very optimistic. Um, I'm actually pretty worried that the regulation will change. Oh, yeah. um, and the reason why is that we tend to associate the fact that because we don't have the liability of the private key or able to spend, that we don't have any liability. And the, re the reality is that we do have the liability of the software that we built. Uh, and so that conveys a huge uh, weight into the equation. Uh, number two, I don't know if you kind of heard the hearing of Mark Zuckerberg was very enlightening, not so much about the answers that were not very always convincing, but about the questions. And many questions were extremely clear about the worries about the possibility of what they called anonymous wallet, which basically is a translation for self-custody wallets. They politicians do not like it at all because no control, no transparency, no anything. So uh, I think they might change their mind about a uh, self-custodial wallet unless, and that's the bonus, there is a technical solution that enables us to also decentralize identity. So like real world identity. So we wouldn't be able, we would be charged to KYC customers and everything, but we would have kind of this gateway to say, well, this guy is not a bad guy. And uh, this guy, he says who is, as is, without going through the process of uh, knowing who is. But if not, I'm, I'm very worried that they change their mind, especially in the US. Yeah, so we have a different situation. So when you said regulation, I winced a little bit because um, we're building a, a decentralized protocol with a decentralized business model, if you will. Um, and governments and regulations were not written or built to even contemplate that. Um, blockchain is, is innovating business models and creating ways to do things like we're doing that just simply are impossible without tokenized economics. And so, yes, we... we have our, are working through with with too many attorneys um, a lot of different aspects. Of that good news is we have a really clear, clear roadmap of how to do that now. But it's time and money that is just fundamentally at the end of the day a waste. It doesn't really add to innovation or creativity or any value to society. Um, so for us, it is you know we've we've had to work through that. I think um, you know it is it's an interesting struggle and it's really at the core of 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 some of the essence of what blockchain is about this struggle between individual privacy and liberty and the need that governments <laughs> feel to be able to monitor every single person to stop the small percentage that are bad actors, right? And none of us want bad people to, you know, use money to go and do bad things um, to people. No, nobody wants that, but, um, yeah, that, that's at the end of the day is the struggle. And you could even have federated KYC. I think someday that concept will exist. I met with a comp company just yesterday that's starting to work on that idea of, gee, could you have federated KYC where you do it once, it can be used everywhere. But, you know, if you have that and it's attached to you everywhere, I mean, you know, surveillance state, it's doesn't matter if it's decentralized at that point. They know who you are. And um, so it's, it, it's an inter interesting social struggle for sure that we've got. I mean, let's remember, people, uh, the government want, uh, at the end of the day, to be 
to get their taxes paid. Really, that's really their number one area of, of worry. More like stopping the bad the bad guys. I mean, of course, like that's a noble goal to have. But what they want is to make sure that people who have to pay taxes. And I think it's a legitimate request. I mean, I don't think everyone wants to escape the taxes. This is our societies are built. After all, you know, we can discuss about it if they do it right. But you need that to happen. So I think they don't. We don't want a system where we escape our fiduciary duty as citizens. And so uh, if a non-custodial self-custodial wallet uh, enable that in some way, and the economy, a large part of the economy goes to self-custodial wallet, then there is an area of worry that is legitimate. And then maybe that will drive them to go against the core principle of, of crypto, which is like, all right, let's do whatever you want and let's not know who you are. I know more than one person in this space who's looking to escape their fiduciary duties. <laughs> I'll tell you that much. Um, very quickly, because we're out of time, in, in one or two sentences, what are you most looking forward to in the next year or two with regards to either the evolving tech around self-custody or even user experience advancements? What's What should everybody be looking into? That's a good question. Um, I'm actually going to zoom out a little bit just because of the sort of the conversations that we've had up here. and. Um, I think that we are not necessarily like at a transformative point in this ecosystem, but I do think that there are some really big sort of subjects that are front of mind. Um, you know, Libra and the recent hearings uh, and then the recent China announcements. I think that it's going to be massively important that we understand um, and we think about and we talk about openly and publicly, you know, what is the value of the things that we're building? Um, you know, why are they valuable? Uh, and, and what do we really want to get out of this? And you know, uh, what, what compromises are we willing to make in order to get there? Um, and obviously, like some of the, the most obvious examples are, you know, um, uh, sacrificing usability for uh, things like privacy or, or things like uh, self custody or you know, every everything, right? Um, and I think that it's a it's been a conversation in a different light, but just knowing, like really knowing <laughs> that China is in this space and they're going to be doing stuff, and the potential of what that means if we don't have, um, if we do have things like, you know, every single account is KYC'd, um, or you know, simply the knowledge that hey, you know, nation states are going to be watching every single transaction, and they are going to be linking the accounts, and they're probably going to be linking these accounts to real-world identities. So when you think about all of that, and then you add it to, um, yeah, you know, you add it, add it to the usability issues in the space and the security issues in the space. I think the next couple of years are going to be very, very interesting. Briefly, because we're Sorry. Br no, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, let's wrap it. Go ahead. Um, Kind of just reiterating, I'm hoping that making the wallet a more permissionless space will light, put gasoline on the fire of innovation and let all these exciting things, uh, you know, uh, mixers and layer two protocols and uh, contract accounts. I think this will be the year to show that permissionless, decentralized innovation beats the heck out of whatever well-funded <laughs> authoritarian project it might be intimidating you otherwise. Yeah, so uh, looking forward to us now starting to really see the use of blockchain and tokenized value in commerce and for utility and actually doing meaningful stuff with this and and our part of enabling that with our launch of our mainnet early next year to enable um, abstraction away public addresses, payment requests, uh, cross-chain metadata, all kinds of things that are impossible today to do between different wallets um, to help that happen. Um, something really transform transformative that could happen to the industry is see gigantic players making a real step, not just intentions and white papers in the real world. So I'm really looking forward to see what happens with Libra, with Telegram, with Kakao in Korea, Clayton, and DCEP. We see what happens, how, how they roll it out. And finally, I really, really wish uh, that uh, mobile platforms, no names, uh, would embrace more, um, both at the technical and terms of services level, the crypto industry that we're built to play with the security enclave in a more better way to secure better our, our apps and that the tools or services and also just the rules of being featured on an app store and what we can do with mobile apps would be uh, fairer, meaning equal to every other category of mobile apps. Um, not better, but just f equal. That's a great way to end it. Thank you. I want to thank our panelists. Please give them a round of applause.